the creative push. Today we have Katrina Revenal from Kansas City. She is a mixed media artist. Welcome, Katrina. Oh, thanks for having me, Sherry. Appreciate it. Tell us a little bit about what you do and what your technique yeah, is. I, I would classify myself as an abstract mixed media artist. In my work, I really like to celebrate graffiti in unusual ways. So my work tends to be very street art inspired almost atmospheric where I kind of draw you into a whole nother world and you can see the raw nature of graffiti in my work and the lines and the gestures but it's an entirely new piece. It all starts with photography and I first fell in love with graffiti when my husband and I were living out in California about 13 years ago and we lived near Venice Beach and if you've ever been to Venice Beach it's, it's got a really bohemian skate culture vibe, lots of vibrant colors, lots of graffiti on like decaying seawalls, very gritty, but there's kind of a beautiful nature to that grittiness. And that's where I first fell in love with graffiti as what I would consider an art form and a form of expression. When we were living there, I started photographing it, but I wasn't sure what I was going to do with those photos. And I started seeing forms in graffiti. There are a lot of, you know, gestures, wonderful colors, and a lot of little tiny bits and pieces, like not whole walls. My process involves actually traveling to a city, kind of researching the areas where graffiti can be found, and actually just hunting it, walking for hours on end, getting to know the public transportation system, going to back alleys, a lot of time spent in underpasses, in railway stations, things like that hunting for these small gestures, these small parts of walls that I do photograph. And it's maybe like a, a section that could be anywhere from four inches to four inches wide, but it has a shape or a line or a color or a tag that I'm really, really drawn to. And when I capture that image, I know how I'll incorporate the essence of it because what I start with is actually taking out like little tiny bits and pieces out of my photographs, what I call street ephemera. So if you look at collage art, you know, you'll see a layering process, how it happens. Someone will maybe cut something out and layer it and then paint over and then layer again. And they'll have this beautiful patina that develops over time. That's what I do, but it just starts out in the digital world. I actually turn it into a digital drawing. So I do a lot of work in Adobe Illustrator. Everything that I do is actually hand printed. It's a process where I have taken the image and it becomes pigment on a piece of film. And I have an emulsion that I apply to the substrate I'm working on. And that gets burnished into the substrate. And then it lifts that pigment off of the film. So that's how the image transfers onto the substrate I'm working on. It's very similar to the process where people will do gel printing. They'll print an image in reverse on a piece of paper and they'll put a gel medium on a canvas and then they'll actually apply the paper and then they'll rub the paper off. It's very similar to that, only that I'm just working in lots and lots of layers and I'm working with film. My studio is in my home and I can work if I'm inspired, I can run down there and work on, you know, work on a piece. And, and because this is a lot of layers and the process is very intricate and labor intensive, and there requires a drying time between layers, often like three to four hours or 24 hours, I'm often working on multiple pieces at one time. So I have lots of easels up in my space. I also have a wall that's on wheels. So I can work on flat canvases and then I can also work on panels on that wall. And then I can just rotate the wall as I'm working. The process is very cool in the fact that I can also mix these pigments with other mediums, you know, such as acrylic paint, spray paint, oil pastel. So I'm using a lot of different mediums while I'm working to achieve the layers and the feel that I want in mixing the imagery. So it does be become very atmospheric. You can see this is one of my pieces behind me. And then there's a lot of my own hand 
and gestures involved in creating the piece as well. I have worked all the way up to uh, 40 by 60, 50 by 60, but in general, the sweet spot seems to be kind of in that general area of 30 by 30. And that seems to be a nice size for people's homes that they have a space that they can fit a piece that's 30 by 30 or 30 by 40. I'm taking these little individual individual pieces of street ephemera, almost like, like individual pieces. It's like a puzzle, putting a puzzle piece together on um, the pieces I'm working. So it's very often smaller, what I would consider individual imagery that's going down to create the layers and how I see the piece evolving over time. You know, I have been working on perfecting this process for the last five years. And it's a very finicky process. A lot of things affect how the pigment on the film interacts with the emulsion, humidity, time of year. There's a solution that you have to mix. And sometimes if you don't mix it properly, then the actual pigment doesn't lift off of the film. And there's a different process of whether or not you're working on sometimes paper, or if you're working on canvas or wood or metal. So it's all different. It's almost like cooking. Over time, when you've made this dish a million times, Times. But each time, if you don't look at a recipe, you might add a little something different and it's even better this time. That's how I kind of equate the process of working with the film and the pigment. It is a recipe that you individually have to develop and it takes so much time and effort, but it's really rewarding at the end because you always end up producing a dish that's like uniquely yours. Das Art is a product line that an artist, Bonnie Lahoda, developed. It uses a hydrostatic solution. The solution interacts with pigment inks. It's an interaction between this emulsion that actually lifts the ink off of the film when you burnish it into a substrate. There's a lot to do with timing, how you place the film on your substrate. It's a really unique process in that it's multiple steps and you can't rush it and you can't skip a step. You have to actually wash off the emulsion. If you don't let it dry enough, it'll wash off the ink. And if you you are too hard on washing it off, it'll take ink off. And so it's a very precise method and it takes a long time to perfect, but it's a really unique way to make a print because that's what you're doing. You're being a printmaker. It's just a very interesting way to take your digital imagery and make a print from it. What was your path into the world of art? I was really lucky because both my mom and her mother were very creative people. My grandmother, she was a wonderful writer. She was very interested in collecting things. So as a kid going to her house, it just sparked her creativity because she had an attic full of old clothes and things that she collected and old books and magazines and drawings. And she was always making these interesting sculptures crazily enough out of rocks and dehydrated bones, but they were very <laughs> interesting. And my grandfather, her husband used to make these little pieces of furniture out of beer cans with all these scrolls. And so between the two of them, their house was very eclectic and very creative. She, my grandmother was into horoscopes and dream interpretation. The more creative you were, the more you could talk about being creative and making things. That was an everyday conversation with the two of them. My mom was what I would consider more of a crafter. We always had things like around the house to make stuff, all kinds of different papers and pom-poms, you know, the little like little yarn pom-pom balls and glue and scissors and tape and paint and everything. I always had that as a kid. And I think that really helped because I'm an only child. You do spend a lot of time entertaining yourself. And one of the ways that I did that was through art. So I was always drawing and, and making things. I was always encouraged to do that as well. I was always making art. I was the art girl in high school, I painted all the backdrops for our plays and the yearbook covers, designed those. And I was always involved in art, but my my first inclination was to write and I actually went, ended up going into communications and then for 18 years I was in sales in the packaging industry and I was working with creatives. I was always working with advertising agencies and design firms. My earliest contact was with the creative director and they would have a way that they needed to package a direct mail piece. I would always sit and sketch out how the box would come together and actually do the 3D drawing. It wasn't until we moved to California and we were really living in such a creative place 
And it was kind of my time to say, wait a minute, maybe I'd like to explore this more. And so I did go back to school at Otis College of Art and Design. California was wonderful, but we did decide that we needed to move back to Kansas City to be close for family. And it's been a great move for us. We've been back here for 10 years. And the art community in Kansas City is a really great, tight-knit, supportive community to be in. I think having Hallmark here, the Art Institute, it draws a lot of creative people to live in Kansas City. It's been really great for me from that standpoint to have that network of peers and patrons. How do you sell your art? I am actually represented by Weinberger Fine Art here in Kansas City. That gallery represents my work. I do work with collectors all over the country that contact me. Typically, that might find my work on Instagram. What inspires you? First and foremost, I'd say graffiti, just because of its form, the patina, the beautiful decay that comes with the wall that's been painted over and over again, and the weather has affected it. Little things are chipping off. To me, that is really inspiring when I'm thinking about my work and the layering of it. Some of that had changed a little bit during the pandemic in that I couldn't really travel to photograph graffiti. So it did evolve in that I was thinking, well, what could what I do? And one of my other loves is our botanicals. So during this time where I really couldn't travel to photograph graffiti in other cities, I started actually spending a lot of time in botanical gardens in and around Kansas City. And that was very inspirational. Just the forms of the flowers and the colors. It was sort of a refuge for me. I'm very fortunate to have my studio space in my home. So I was able to work. I know a lot of artists were for a little bit displaced from their studios when the city shut down. There were certain studio buildings that were not open and they had to find and scramble for alternative spaces to work in during that time. So I was really fortunate. And the slower pace where we had the initial shutdown, there were a lot of times where my demands on my time, my personal time from volunteer work or from family or from friends that all kind of slowed down a little bit. And it opened up more time for me personally in my studio and more time to explore my work, which was really nice. And it was really comforting. And it gave me a sense of freedom. I know that sounds strange, but freedom to really create something entirely new, not to worry, well, I have to get this done for a show. Well, there's no show coming up. So I can just kind of explore and have more fun. In a sense, this freedom without a time constraint, you know, it's okay to make a mistake. If I don't like something, sand it down, start over. There's just no deadline on anything. And that was just sort of a free pass to be more creative. Do you ever get stuck? And if you do, how do you pull yourself out of that place? Because I'm working on several pieces at one time, if I tend to get stuck on one, I might set it aside for a few days and then move on to the next one because of the process of the layering and the times that it needs to dry and the inks need to cure. There's a somewhat of a panic that sets in. If you're like working on one piece and you get stuck and you don't know how to resolve it, you're like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. Well, but if you're working on several at one time and you can kind of set that one that's giving you fits away for a couple of days, sometimes I find that helpful. What I also find helpful for me is that before I get up in the morning and get out of bed, I usually lay there for a little bit and I think about what I'm going to make that day. The steps on from what is in my head and how I'm going to make that happen because sometimes I'll have to rethink how I'm going to do something or what medium I'm going to use. So very often I'll think about the pieces I'm working on and have sort of a loose plan because with the abstract work, things can always change. That's kind of how my process works. You know, and if I get stuck, I'll just put on some tunes, zone out for a minute and then restart too. So that seems to be helpful. Do you have any strange or odd collections? Because my grandmother collected so much and because my mom collected so much, I I tend not to. I grew up that way. It felt like a lot of times it felt like the walls were closing in. So I tend to not have collections because of that. It stifles the way I think. My work is very layered with lots of elements. So I think I have to have a lot less around me. I do like the era of the 50s. Mid-century modern, the atomic era. Our house was built in 1950. I do tend to like vintage barware. 
I also have a small collection, probably eight of them, but they're called head vases. These vases of women's heads. And usually they're wearing beautiful hats from the 1950s, or they might even have a little pearl earring dangling. Basically, they were flower vases. The piece behind me was a very special commission for my husband for his Zoom calls. I don't usually work very dark. This was kind of an exploration for me because I tend to love to use soft, bright colors that are happy, atmospheric, dreamy state. The botanical uh, imagery tends to be bright because I had a solo show called Let Democracy Bloom. And it evolved over the months leading up to our election in that I was inspired by, there was a poster that had been blanketed across Kansas City that just said vote 2020 on it. It was decaying in lots of places and coming off the wall. It just really inspired me because at that time there was just so much division and so much turmoil that I felt like we could not sit this election out, that we had to participate. And we had to turn an era that seemed very divisive and not very positive into something positive and uniting. That's how that whole show came together. It was me in my emotional response to that, using the one word, the vote, in having these images of the butterfly and resilience and having a leap of faith. There's one piece that's called Leap of Faith with, with uh, a toad that I photographed. That whole show was very colorful because that was kind of my hope for the future. What advice would you give to an upcoming artist who might want to study your style of work or someone who might just want to be an artist in general? And the first thing I would say is find your community. I think it's so important to have peer-to-peer -peer interaction, the ins and outs of putting your work out there, getting your work out there, not being afraid to show your work because it isn't very intimidating to put your creative process out there, your thoughts, your work. I would say if you're an emerging artist, find an art advocacy group. Almost every city has one. They will shepherd you along in your process and encourage you, encourage you to apply for shows. You can seek advice. You can talk to other artists about their process. Do a studio visit. If there's an artist that you admire, you'd be mm -hmm. surprised about how many artists are willing to do that. Follow people on Instagram. See what people are doing. How is their work evolving? What are they doing in their process videos? Apply for shows. Even if you think your work might not be ready, it's a good learning experience to apply for shows. And you might be surprised. There's a website called Cafe Management through Call for Entry. And it shows shows nationwide. Oftentimes they'll have a theme, like one that's coming up is called the blue. And it's all like blue art. Look for workshops. If there is a skill you want to learn, lots of artists offer workshops. That's another way to start learning a new process and expanding what you do and adding to your repertoire. Is there anything that you would like to learn? I've never dabbled with oil painting. That would be something that is a little fascinating to me. Maybe attempting to do some plein air painting. I think that would be a fun way for me to expand my creative muscle, think differently and do that. But I've also always wanted to learn to play the cello. The cello always fascinates me and maybe someday that's one odd thing that I would like to try. Uh, where can people find your work? I'm on Instagram at KR Mixed Media. And I also am on Facebook. I am represented by Weinberger Fine Art here in Kansas City. They have a big catalog of my work. I have my own website and that's krmixedmedia.com. So thanks so much, Katrina, for letting me interview you for the Creative Push. Well, it was such a pleasure. It was great talking with you, Sherry. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.